Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them tonight to the book of Haggai. Book of Haggai. I'm not sure if I will be able to finish everything up for uh, the book of Haggai tonight, but we will we'll get as far as we can anyway. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and then Haggai. <laughs> Only two chapters, but uh, it's interesting because Haggai is a little bit of an older gentleman. He is not one of the uh, the younger prophets of this day. He is. Uh, a little older in the in as far as some of the things that I can find and that I can read, uh, he is uh, prophesying a little bit during the captivity of uh, the Babylonian captivity that uh, has started. It uh, bleeds over into, of course, a couple other uh, world powers, if you would. It starts off with the, the Babylonian Empire, and then uh, from there, uh, let's see if any of you can remember some of your Bible history and things. Uh, but once Babylon, for the most part, falls, do, who remembers who takes over next? Now, it's prophesied in the book of Daniel. It's also described in Daniel's vision of what uh, is going to be taking place. But the, the next world power that comes on the scene, does anybody recall? Brother Caleb? No? All right, the Medes and the Persians, and uh, then uh, the, the Syrians or the Persians come after uh, the Medo-Persian Empire and uh, with Cyrus and things. But uh, the interesting thing about the book of Haggai is we are introduced to a uh, person in the very first verses uh, that Daniel knew, lived through, and, uh, and had dealings with. And so uh, notice, if you would please, in the book of Haggai, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, in the second year of Darius the king. Now, there were two Darius in, uh, in Scripture, uh, and this is, the, this is one that uh, Daniel knew. And uh, the truth is, we'll turn back here in just a minute to the book of Daniel, just a few pages back, and uh, look at who he was. But let me read just a, a few more verses here in the book of Haggai. Beginning in verse number one, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of, uh, and I have been trying to make sure that I pronounce this correctly all day, and I've, I've messed it up every time, Shiltael, governor of Judah, and to uh, Joshua, to the son of Jeshadak, the high priest, saying, thus, uh, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say the time has not come, the time the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your seal houses, and this house lay waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye, uh, ye clothe you, but there is none more. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It's interesting to see the Lord now is beginning to ask for something. The Lord needs nothing. He doesn't. But one thing that he is asking for in these verses is this. He has asked before that you begin to prioritize your life and what you do and what you have and put God at the zenith of this priority list. Now, God doesn't ask for a lot of physical things, but here he has asked the children of Israel to consider something. Uh, David, a long time ago, asked if he could build a house for God. God said, told him no, but he would let Solomon build a temple and build a house for God. So Solomon did build a temple because of their disobedience, because of their not keeping the, uh, the, 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 what God had asked and obeyed, God allowed devastation to come. We find out in 2 Kings just a number of things uh, that were allowed at that time and some of the reasoning behind it. So because of that, of course, through idolatry uh, was the case because they did not keep uh, what God, the provision as far as keeping the Sabbath as he has asked for the land and that. 
and uh, because of the, their, their just disobedience, uh, allowing those things, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come over and devastate Israel, well, Judah at the time, and began to sack the temple and steal the things and destroy it. Well, it has laid waste now for a long time. The children of Israel have been in captivity, but now there are, God is saying, you know what? It's time to begin to rebuild and put things back in, in place as they used to be. He said, so you've taken care of yourself, but you've left my house and you've left me for the most part, if you want to put it like that, just laid waste. He said, so I have pulled back what I have or what I could provide for you. Now understand something, God still does the very same thing today. And we'll look at some of those because he has said it, he made it very clear here, you're working hard, you're doing a lot. You're just not, not getting the product that you want. He says, and the reason being is, and if all of us could remember this, it is not the ground that produces, it is God that produces. It is not your job that produces, it is God that produces. So when we finally come to a point where it's like, well, I've got health and I've got uh, the ability to work, all those things are wonderful and God has given them to you. But if you really want things to excel in your heart and life, then you have got to have God as a priority in your life. You've got to realize the reason why we have that ability is because God has provided it. The reason why we have what we have is because God has provided it. Notice as he has spoken, as Haggai now is telling them in verse number five, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts. It's interesting because all through scripture in the first, uh, well, both chapters, the Lord is using a phrase or a, a term that he doesn't use very often. When he uses the term Lord of hosts, it is a military address is what it is. Because what he is saying is, I am the one who is the Lord of a very mighty host. And in that instance, he has reminded them even at one point about how that he led them out of Egypt. Now this is literally hundreds and hundreds of years later. But he is addressing them saying, he is calling and uh, as Haggai, he says, tell him the Lord of hosts. He who has rule over a great mighty army. And so here he, he reminds him in verse number five of that very thing. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now in Proverbs chapter number, uh, let, me, let me see if I can, Proverbs chapter number 16. Scripture says when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. But when the Lord comes and says, consider your ways, apparently they are doing something that they should not be doing. And they are allowing now their own selfishness to begin to take a priority in their life instead of God having a priority in their life. It, uh, however it is that you deal with that manner, whether you come to God and say, God, I don't care what it is. If I have it and you want it, you can take it anytime you want it. Whatever it is that I have, whether it's health, whether it's any prosperity that I happen to have, whatever it is that I have, God, if you want it, it's yours. I don't, I don't know. However you, however you have managed to do that, however you do that, uh, it, it is a major priority in the life of a Christian that you say, Lord, my life, Lord, is yours to control. And in this manner, he is reminding them, because you have not done this, let me tell you the outcome of it. Verse number six says, ye have sown much and bring in little. Now, why is that? He says, you've put great effort into this and you get a little bit. He says, kind of frustrating, isn't it? So he goes to the very next thing and he says, and you drink, but you're not filled with drink. He says, you're constantly lacking. You're always thirsty for a little bit more because you're not satisfied. Reason being is, he says, you have not come to the satisfier. He says, because you're trying to accomplish something. He said, but if you really want to accomplish something, get me involved and things will be accomplished. And he goes on to say, and he, he gives a number of different things. He says, uh, you even have come to a point, the last part of the verse says, and he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put in a bag with holes. He says, you've, you've just been spinning your wheels. You've been going in circles. And he says, you've not accomplished what you want to accomplish. He said, so let me tell you why. He has already told him to consider your ways. He said, the reason being is, of course, in verse number four, he said, because you have looked at the physical for your own prosperity and have forgotten about what I need to, pro or how I need to prosper in this manner. He said, you have taken care of your own 
but you have not taken care of me. And God says, I don't ask for a lot of physical priorities in your life. He said, but my house, I want to have a priority so that because it is a physical example of what others can see. Look, there's been many times folks have, have driven past uh, our church here and, uh, and on occasion they have even stopped and said, we just want to see what's going on. There's people that, that come on Sunday. They just want to see what's going on. We've had a, a f- different families that are here that said, you know what, we've just kind of watched things happen because we, we drive past, we work over here, so we drive past and we just want to see what's going on. They stop in to visit. Now, I know very clearly that, that our church is not for everybody. I know that. It should be, but they're not in a, they're not in a point uh, just yet where they say, uh, you know, you, you guys are kind of straight-laced, aren't you? It's like, yeah, we love God. That's just all it is. We're not looking for the world to come in and, and start, uh, you know, turning things into just a social club. That is not what we are. We are a church. We want God to get the honor. We're not worried about entertainment. We're worried about God getting what he wants and him getting the glory. And sometimes that, uh, that is in a little bit of object to the way the, the world wants to operate. I don't fuss about it. I don't get upset about it. I used to. I used to worry. Oh, my lands. When I first got started in the ministry, I used to worry. Oh, what if no one comes? No, what if no one comes? Now it's like, if they don't want to, if they don't want to come, they're the one that's going to miss out, not us. And so in that manner, are the doors open? Yes. Is everybody invited? Yes. But not everybody's going to come. And people are going to lack because of it. You said, is that, what, is that really the way you think? Yes, it is. I think, I think God meets with us on a very regular basis. And uh, in that manner, I think people sometimes miss out because they're looking, for, they're looking for a feeling. I've told you before, if you want a feeling, lick the wall socket. You'll get a feeling. But God is not here just to thrill us. He is here to fill us. And so in that manner, it is not the fact that uh, we need to feel tingly about something. It's the fact that God is the one who, who, now he can provide a tingle, no doubt about it. But I'm telling you, there's nothing like answered prayer. There's nothing like knowing that God is working in your heart and life. There's nothing like that. There's not a physical thing in that manner. But God says here, he said, you have forgotten the fact that you need to prioritize something. And if this house of mine is going to help you to prioritize me in your life, then don't set it aside. Make sure that it, make sure that that is something that has a priority in your heart and life. And that is exactly what he is addressing here. And so Haggai is reminding them of that very thing. God is still in control. Now, In the the very first verses that we read in Haggai, verse number one, in the second year of Darius the king. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn back a few pages to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number six, if you would. Daniel chapter number six. Shouldn't have to turn back too many pages, but uh, Daniel chapter number six. Nebuchadnezzar has gone off the scene now. Uh, Belshazzar has uh, taken over for a little bit. It is the very time where he begins to, uh, uh, he is, is leading things for the most part in the, uh, in the kingdom. He decides to get the, uh, some of the, the cups that came from the house of God and begins to drink wine and have a, a big to-do and things of that nature and invites a number of folks and they're just having a, a big drunken party. And God shows up. The handwriting that shows up on the wall, literally. And in that instance, uh, the, basically the judgment is, is given to Belshazzar at the time and reminded him that it's going to be taken from him. The kingdom is going to be taken from him. And uh, in uh, verse number, uh, chapter number 5 and verse number 30 says, And that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Midian took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Then in verse number six, it said, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three uh, presidents of whom Daniel was first. For the princes might uh, give account unto them, and the king should have no uh, damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because of an excellent spirit in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So Daniel was very influential. The reason being is... (laughs) Should we, should we turn back a few more pages and find out where it says that he had an excellent spirit? The Bible reminds us right here that the Lord was with him and he kept God as a priority in his heart and life, in everything. 
they knew that they, uh, they because Daniel was Christ honoring, if you want to use that term, in this manner, of course, they couldn't find any fault against him. So what do they do? They bring an occasion and said, hey, king, let, let's do this. Uh, how about if anybody asks any petition of anybody else other than you, because you are such a great and mighty king, that, uh, that there would be punishment? And he said, you know what? That's a good plan. And, uh, and so they write it down, and he stamps it of the law of the Medes and the Persians, so that it cannot be changed. And the Bible reminds us that after the decree was signed, Daniel knew it. Now, what they were going to do is they needed to, because they knew Daniel went and prayed every single day and asked petition of his God. So now if Daniel was to do that, there's going to be punishment made. And all of a sudden, can, can I say it again, that sometimes the government just does not get it right. So sometimes it, there is going to be things that are going to come your way and my way that are not going to be in line with our Christian values. They're just not. But it does not mean that you and I need to succumb to some of those things. See, this is where we get in trouble. Because you say, are, are you against government? Of course not. Of course not. Because God has instituted, he put it in place for a reason. But when the government demands that you have to bow down to, the, to this instead of God, sorry, I can't do that. Now, does that mean that God's going to relieve me of all of the, the circumstances? No. It could be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You get tossed into the fiery furnace, and it won't be a pleasant time, and it won't be easy. Just like Daniel. Daniel's now not a young man any longer. He has lived through a number of kings. He has lived now through a number of individuals that he's seen come to power and seen fall. And he has still kept an excellent spirit through all those things. But now comes the decree. Hey, have, have you ever worked at a place and they, uh, they keep getting a new supervisor so they keep trying the same dumb idea that they've tried five times before? <laughs> it didn't work the first time. It's not going to work this time. But you have to live through it. And you have to endure that. You have to shake your head a little bit. And you may say, this ain't going to work. But you have to waste your time and energy going through it again. Here's Daniel. He says, here's another king. God's still going to have to show how big he is. He is, not, uh, he is a great God and he can do it again. He is not afraid of that. He knows very clearly that God is able. So if you're right there in Daniel, I want you to notice chapter number 6 and verse number 10. By the way, chapter number 6 is the only one where Darius shows up. He is, he is mentioned in chapter number 5 at the very end, and chapter number 6 gives us the, the event that happened with Darius. But the decree that he made towards the end of this is paramount because peace was for 30 years under Darius. So I want you to notice in verse number 10, Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his window being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He knew the decree was signed. He couldn't hide it. He didn't close his windows. He wasn't trying to do it in secret. He said, I know why the decree was signed. He said, and I knew it exactly. And so in that instance, in verse number 11, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake unto the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that should ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall he be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Not just once, but three times. <laughs> well, we find out the events that took place. This is the, uh, the story where Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. God didn't remove him from it. He made him go through that very circumstance that was there. But Daniel had God as a priority, and prioritized him in his life. So there's not a reason in the world why Daniel should not uh, think for a second. Now, does it mean that he's 
going to have it easy? Oh, no. Do you think that he knew already that the lions were going to have their mouths shut? Nope. He just knew if, if God put me in that circumstance, if today is my last day, then I'll just go be with the Lord. It's one of those things where you don't enjoy those things. You don't look forward to it. It's just you're not afraid of it. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to be worried, anxious, and it may make your heart race, but it just means, look, God's in control. He knows who I am, where I'm at, and I'm standing for him. Haggai is reminding these people of Judah, you need to remember God. He doesn't ask for a lot of, pro he doesn't ask for a lot of physical things, but he has asked now that you not leave his house and lay waste. He has asked for a physical thing now. It seems like such a trifling that we would leave it set uh, unattended. So in that manner, he is reminding them of that. So he uses that term twice, verse number five and verse number seven in Haggai chapter number one, consider your ways. So he is reminding them that there is a priority for God. Now, I want to look at one more thing in, this, uh, in what is being done here as he is asking for us to consider how we live, what we do with the time that we have been given. Because here's the choice. As he is addressed in verse number six, do you work? Oh, sure. Do you put forth effort? Yes. Are you getting the result that you want? Well, no, I'd like it to be a whole lot better than what it is. Well, then you need to get God connected to what you're doing then. And in that manner, if you want to prioritize God, then the very same things that you had done one time will produce a great deal more. And the very same effort that you put forth is going to accomplish a great more than what it did. Because God is the prosperer of what goes on. He is the blesser. And if you want those little frustrations removed, then honor God with our ways, our substance, the things that we have, and the things that we do. God has given everybody 24 hours a day. We need to make sure that we give God his time. He provides for us and supplies for us. Thank him for the country that you live in, the place that you're at, the things that he has provided, and then make sure to honor him with the substance of our first fruits, if you want to put it like that. Because otherwise, what will happen? There will be leanness. And God says, if you want a bounty, then make sure that you, uh, he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. But realizing, God, I'm giving to your efforts, not mine. And in that manner, just make sure to keep him as a priority. Because notice what takes place after some of these things are done. Uh, I, I'm not going to read through all the verses here. But I want you to know, we may go back and read them at another time. But look, if you would, please, in verse number 14. Because it says here, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheathael, uh, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jeshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts. Notice how it's phrased, their God. When they begin to recognize him as God, all of a sudden things begin to change. And now as they recognize their God as being their God, we see here that there are some amazing things that begin to take place. Now, it's not the end of it. The truth is, chapter number two, there are uh, three other things that are mentioned uh, that, uh, that God is dealing with the children of Israel. And uh, mostly, let, let, let me just mention this before we, most of the captivity that we think about, because when we, we think about the children of Israel, the truth is, you help me here. It's not really test time, but we'll recap here just a little bit. Uh, the kingdom was divided under uh, Solomon's son. Who remembers his name? Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the kingdom was divided. He was told, and by the way, it was told during Samuel's life that this was going to take place. Matter of fact, uh, there was a prophet that actually spoke to an individual and told him, God's going to give you ten kingdoms, or ten, ten tribes of the kingdom. Does anybody recall who that was that, that God told him that? Solomon, Solomon was going to kill him. He was very impressive in the kingdom at the time. And uh, Solomon tried to, was going to kill him, so he ran and left and went down to Egypt. No, it was Jeroboam. Jeroboam had ten tribes and went to the north. God told him that that was going to take place. So, and, of course, one tribe basically is, is priests for all of them, the Levites. And there was one tribe in the southern kingdom, 
Judah. That's where Jerusalem was. And in that instance, that southern tribe of Judah, for the most part, is why the Babylonian captivity took place. It didn't, it, it, it didn't cover all of Israel. It covered basically that one tribe in the south there, Judah, and took them captive and laid waste Jerusalem, took them back to Babylon. And in that instance, God is dealing with them. Now, there comes a point where he begins to deal with both, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But a great deal of the Old Testament deals with that southern kingdom, Judah. And uh, the, the pre-captivity books, the, the during the captivity and the post-captivity books. That circumference around Jerusalem right there in, uh, in, in the tri- for the tribe of Judah. Now all of them are affected by it. But the truth is a great deal of what is going on, God is dealing with that, that southern kingdom, Judah. And in that manner, God now asks for chapter number one. He says, this is what I want. I want. I want a priority in your life. And in that instance, he says, I want that priority to be the fact that you take care of my house and consider your ways. He said, and so in chapter number two, he begins to address a little bit more of those ways. We'll talk about that in the, uh, in the next time we get a chance to meet. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for the truth of your word. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, through the prophet Haggai, how that uh, we do need to prioritize you in our heart and life. I ask that you'd please just help us now, Lord, and I ask that you'd please just work to accomplish your will. Thank you again for all that you do, and we ask now for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.